Welcome to the presentation of the History of Phelps Grove Park. This presentation is brought to you by Richard Crabtree, Murney Associate Realtors, a full-service realtor covering southwest Missouri, specializing in the sale of older homes. Well, we can't talk about Phelps Grove without first talking about George Catlin. He's kind of the one person who is basically pointed to as discovering the area. He came through here around 1850-1820. He was a noted Indian painter and came across some Kickapoo and Osage Indians by Fast Night Creek. He noticed that there was wigwams, but unusually he noticed that there was some wooden cabins. Uh, apparently, there were half-breed descendants left behind from Coronado and DeSoto as they traversed the area. Well, the person who really is tied to the development of Phelps Grove is Mary Whitney Phelps. Uh, after John and Mary came to Springfield, Mary quite often found herself alone while John was seeking political ambitions or working at the courthouse or later on serving in the military. And uh, she was tired of being downtown, so they acquired a thousand acres southeast of the square. And while John was away, Mary had a cabin built. This is a hand drawing done by William H. Johnson, who I'll be speaking about later, of that particular cabin. Well, as the Civil War broke out, the uh, North and the South would uh, find their first battle down here as far as Springfield's concerned over in Battlefield. And uh, General Lyons had came through and stopped at Mary's farm and had dinner uh, also with a Ulysses S. Grant. And uh, they chatted for a while, became fast friends, and uh, she promised that uh, if something would happen to General Lyons out of the battlefield, that uh, she would uh, look after his body. Well, <laughs> no sooner she made that promise than she had to do something, because on uh, August 10, 1861, um, he died on the battlefield, and his body was brought downtown, and she had to deal with a uh, Confederate soldier who was uh, content on cutting out his heart. Mary appealed to him after a long talk, uh, asking, what would your mother think of you for doing something like this? So he uh, opted to leave. She got the body in a coffin and uh, put it on a buckboard and rode it back out to the farm and uh, hid it in a cooling house uh, from the Confederates. Uh, it was located uh, approximately where Virginia and Portland is today, so in between University Heights and Phelps Grove Park. This is another drawing that William H. Johnson did, and this is of that particular cooling house. Well, during the war, the farm uh, became a makeshift hospital for both the Confederate and Union Army and also was an orphanage. So after the war, the uh, Congress decided uh, to give Mary a nice stipend for helping things uh, along, and uh, she started a orphanage and a school. Now, that school was located uh, approximately Caddy Corner from where the Wonders of Wildlife Museum is there at Sunshine and Campbell. Uh, Mary died in 1878. And John, uh, after being our governor, died up in St. Louis, November 22nd, 1886. Well, the land changes hands, and uh, Edith and Lucy, who had inherited the land from their father, uh, sold the land to a friend of John's up in St. Louis, Minna Fulbacher. She was a widow of a beer baron, and she had bought all that land for $25,000. Part of the land would also become normal park uh, addition. So we can see here in this particular uh, drawing from 1904, the land that Minna Fulbacher would own all the way up to Grand. Well, the Phelps Grove Park Company was founded on December 3rd of 1910. Francis Xavier Herr was looking for a way to get involved in the real estate boom that was going on in Springfield at the time and uh, decided to put together this particular park uh, company. Um, December the 8th, they acquired 
the land for $54,000. So Minna did pretty good in doubling her money. And it was supposed to be considered an upscale subdivision. Company consisted of Francis Xavier Herr, John Landers, Arch McGregor, M.C. Baker, and all were directors, including D.M. Knoll. Well, as I have spoke many times, Springfield has a very large connection to St. Louis and Kansas City, and uh, they wanted to have the best landscape architect lay out this particular subdivision. So they went to the uh, Frederick Olmsted of the West, as he was known, George E. Kessler. Uh, Mr. Kessler was the director of the Kansas City Park System. He uh, designed the 1904 World's Fair uh, layout in Forest Park. He then redesigned Forest Park after the 1904 World's Fair. He designed approximately 230 projects in 23 states, including our fair Phelps Grove Park. Of course, here's some, some of the beautiful layouts and designs that he aided with in the 1904 World's Fair. After his two visits and some topographical maps and several hundred photographs, this is what they gave us. Uh, Phelps Grove Park subdivision as it was plotted out in 1912. The lots here were just massive. Uh, this is also one of the reasons why it wasn't quite successful because a lot of people really weren't looking for lots quite this large. He designed a general layout, the roads, the bridges, and the entryways. At this time it was still considered to be a high-end subdivision. So the most successful realtor or seller of real estate in the Springfield area at the time uh, was William H. Johnson. Uh, Mr. Johnson uh, was friends with Francis Xavier Herr, and he thought of nobody else that could actually do a quite a successful job of selling this, so he reached out to him. Mr. Johnson was uh, Springfield's first city attorney, and uh, did that for about a year before heading down to Forsyth and uh, striking uh, up uh, quite a business down there as an attorney selling mineral and lumber rights and land. Uh, was known to be exceptionally honest and highly regarded, so he was brought back to Springfield to help sell Pickwick Place and the Hawthorne Place. Did quite well with all that, and he was able to take his money and uh, buy a little place that most of us are familiar with, Meadowmere Place. This was his personal subdivision, and he built his own house there. Uh, this was all taking place around the 1906, 7, 8, 9 time frame. And about that same time, he was also developing a little place that many of us have heard of, Hollister, Missouri. Uh, this would be around 1910, 11, 12 is when a lot of the English portions of Hollister were laid out. And he was instrumental in building the bank and the English Inn, several of the buildings, and then also suggesting to the Missouri Pacific to build the uh, train station and the English design of stone and stucco. Incidentally, this would be a plan that would be utilized for our pavilion in Phelps Grove Park. So Johnson's hired to market and sell the subdivision. He and his son had the land cleared and graded and, and the roads uh, built and the entries and the bridges. This took about two years. Now Will, or W.W. W. Johnson, was living in uh, Hollister and moved up to Springfield to help dad with the project. He would also end up building a house on Phelps Grove Park on clay, which we'll be seeing a little bit later. These are the entrances. We have the Dollison entrances, which are still there. We have the National entrance, which is quite large and look quite a bit like some of the entrances that you would see up in St. Louis for some of the grand subdivisions that were up there. Unfortunately, since it was on national and that was considered a highway at the time, um, the uh, highway department uh, requested that Mr. Johnson disassemble that one as it was too close to the road. Here's one of the beautiful bridges that they built. Uh, 
This is the one that uh, would be on Brookside turning north onto Clay and then uh, turning onto Bennett. The beginning of the park. Well, what happened? Uh, the timing was horrible and the design wasn't quite what the people were looking for. In this 1912-1914 time frame, they also were competing against John T. Woodruff, who had his own subdivision called Country Club District, which happened to be just north of the Country Club on Glenstone, and the subdivision looked quite a bit like some of the high-end subdivisions that people were accustomed to in St. Louis and Kansas City. The problem with Phelps Grove was it seemed like you were in the woods, it reminded people too much of the wooded areas of like Hollister, which a lot of us enjoy, but at that time frame, a lot of the women did not want to live in the woods. So, they were trying to figure out what in the world are we going to do. So, they ended up approaching the brand new parks board that had just been formed in 1913 and convincing them wouldn't it be absolutely wonderful if we could have a park dedicated to our great late... John S. Phelps and call it Phelps Grove Park. Uh, it took some wrangling, but they uh, were able to pull it off and uh, the, the Parks Board acquired it for the tidy sum of $50,000. So pretty much for what uh, Francis had in the whole development, he uh, was able to sell to the Parks Board. They were still able to sell the land around the park um, and make money on that, but uh, that would not prove to be very fruitful either. Well, as I had mentioned that uh, George Kessler was exceptionally well known, um, he was exceptionally busy and did not want any more involvement in this part. So he said, hey, there's a couple of young guys, although they're not terribly young, but there's a couple of guys up in Kansas City that I work with. I think you should contact them and they can help you design the park aspect. So in comes Hare and Hare, Sidney J. and Herbert Hare. Now, they are well known to you, uh, especially if you're from the Kansas City area, as they were the landscape designers of the Country Club Plaza, J.C. Nichols Country Club, and uh, really the one that I know a lot that's in Tulsa is called Villa Philbrook, which is now the Philbrook Museum, and it is uh, quite a stunning place as you'll see in this particular picture. And if you do get a chance to go to Tulsa, please do stop by and see this. It is breathtaking. So the first plans for the park that they had designed uh, was going to have a massive lake, uh, would be south of the pavilion, and then they would have several smaller lakes with Fast Night Creek running uh, in between them, and then they'd make little dams and stop it up and so forth. Well, there's a little problem with that, as any of us who have grown up around here or lived here for any time know, that fast night tends to get full pretty quick, and there's a lot of water that can rush through there, and these lakes would be constantly flooded. So they kind of scrapped that idea, and they went to a second idea. This one would be a lake that was quite massive, and they would run the stream, fast night, along the bottom separate, and uh, they would have a, a beautiful pavilion. They actually wanted a waterfall uh, by that. The tennis courts would be just to the east in between the lake. And there would be this grand entrance to the top. Uh, it was uh, a beautiful design. And they followed through with many of the aspects of it. So the first ad actually utilized the original design, not the second one they adapted, when Mr. Johnson started reselling Phelps Grove Park. He also started selling a little subdivision just to the west called Jefferson Place. Now, those lots were small, and they sold like hotcakes. As I had mentioned, W.W. or Will Johnson ended up building a house on the park, and it was really the first house on the park. It was a stucco arts and craft, beautiful house at 1329 South Clay, still there today, and had been in the family for approximately 100 years. The inside of the house was absolutely stunning. Crawford ceilings and uh, beautiful wainscoting and a fume dark oak. Uh, just truly an arts and craft gem. Well, the lake 
and I get lots of questions about the lake. The lake basically was laid out in 1914. They had to dig it out, build a dam, um, build a, a spillover, and uh, they drilled for two wells and decided to use separate water as opposed to relying on Fast Night Creek. Lake stretch on, from National to Kings. Uh, it was 200 feet by about 1,200 feet. Uh, they claim at that time it was twice the size of the Doling Park Lake. And here is design of that lake that Hare and Hare had came up with, and they started this uh, in earnest in 1915. The lake was stunning. I mean, it, it was a, a beautiful thing. It was closer to a lot more people than going all the way up to Doling. Um, it was thin enough that you could easily freeze it and ice skate in the winter. Uh, they brought in pelicans and geese and duck, swans. Uh, these were all part of the zoo, which I'll be discussing. And uh, this, of course, was a place that if you wanted to cool off, you could come over here and hop on the lake. They had some beaches. They had uh, little places to change your clothes and the chairs to lay out. And they had concessions out there. So it was quite a fun little place to come to. This is a neat picture that I acquired on eBay. Um, if you were to come out of the art museum today and look to your right, straight up Pennsylvania, this was the view in 1924. Now, you're going to notice something in this picture in the next couple that um, there are very few trees. Well, that's because we are living in the Kickapoo Prairie, and uh, there are not many trees in the prairie. So most of the trees you see in and around Phelps Grove Park, University Heights, and so forth were planted in the last hundred years. This is a great photograph of, uh, taken from the Dominic Danzero collection that happens to be at MSU. Uh, for those of you that are familiar with Machinos and their family, um, this is uh, the grandfather who uh, was an avid photographer, and his family went all over the place in southwest Missouri, and they had these wonderful photographs. This happens to be a picture taken in 1916 of the Phillips Grove Park Dam and Lake. And this is the spillover. The water in excess would spill over and go on to what we would refer to as Kings today and make its way down the Fast Night Creek. This is a bridge that they had to get you up from Kings to the upper section of the, the lake. And uh, looking behind there, we would be looking at what we would call later on Phelps Grove. Uh, uh, this would be Phelps Park Terrace, but we're looking actually closer in the University Heights. Well, W.W.'s uh, daughter, Frances Johnson, and uh, Jeannie Louise Johnson um, were uh, out here fishing in the lake. I don't know if they had any luck, but uh, this is the berm that you would see that would be along, um, uh, basically uh, lo looking on uh, Brookside. Well, the lake had a little problem. The neighborhood to the north uh, was leaking sewage. Now, we have to remember sewers were still fairly new and a lot of people had septic tanks and some people had lagoons um, for sewage and uh, this particular area was known for more septic and sewer and unfortunately the uh, bacteria that was leaching in the ground into the lake was getting exceptionally high. So by 1927, they realized the lake needed to be drained. And uh, 1928, that following year, it was drained. 1933 to 36, it was kind of interesting because uh, one of Billy Long's relatives uh, was on the beautification committee for the city of Springfield. And Fred decided that uh, we should put this beautiful rose garden in the bottom of the lake because now more people were building south on National. Uh, more people were moving in the University Heights and across the street. And uh, you drove by there and it was just this weeded, overgrown mess. So uh, they opted uh, to, with working with the WPA to put in a flower garden and a fountain and uh, walkways and the open air amphitheater, which you'll, you'll see here shortly. Well, the uh, hair and hairs were kind of out of the picture after they did what they needed to do. And one of uh, Mr. Johnson's, both Johnson's friends that had been an architect uh, 
that helped them design their houses and then also helped design uh, Hollister and uh, design the uh, train station for the Missouri Pacific down there in Hollister. Uh, they reached back out to him, uh, our, and his name was Archibald Norman Torbett. Uh, Mr. Torbett also designed uh, the, the HERS building. He designed our now old courthouse, and uh, he was tapped to come in and design us a beautiful pavilion. And this was easy for him to do because he had designed the train station down there, and so he used a theme of that train station in, uh, with our pavilion here in Phelps Grove, and it was finally built in 1916. Many gatherings would happen at this pavilion. It was kind of the center place to have uh, political rallies, family reunions, birthdays. Uh, people would just drive their cars up to it. They would barbecue, roast there, do whatever. Uh, it was a great place to go and still is today. Little Hoover would bring his band there on Sunday afternoons and they would perform concerts, free concerts. Occasionally you'd find them up at Doling Park, but quite often you'd find them down here at Phelps Grove. They were a little bit closer to where they had their place of business of Hoover Music downtown. Here's one of the uh, uh, gatherings that I talked about. This is a democratic political gathering. What's funny that you'll notice it just above their heads on the columns, you'll see these wooden brackets that kind of go up uh, to the roof line. And what had happened uh, is during 1981, uh, right after they had remodeled the bathrooms, a couple of young boys went in there, started a fire in the men's room, and uh, it burned the entire roof off. So they had to rebuild the roof and redo things. And because of that, those brackets... Uh, were done away with. So if you see the little metal pieces of metal or rods that are protruding out, um, they were for holding the brackets in place. Uh, some people seem to think this is where the zoo was, and it wasn't, and this had nothing to do with the zoo. But regardless, uh, one day hopefully maybe we'll see those brackets reappear. Well, we had some wonderful views inside the park and um, in the neighborhood. Uh, here at the top, we are on uh, north on clay, looking from Brookside, and uh, that hasn't changed much other than we now can go south. Um, and then we have another one from the top of the park, looking south on clay from Catalpa. And then we have one here looking east on Brookside, and then, of course, the kids playing in the park. Well, transportation in Phelps Grove was kind of interesting because we had a little bit of everything. Streetcar line was supposed to connect, but it never did. It stopped up around the university. That line had been laid because uh, many years ago, uh, the fairgrounds is where MSU uh, is today and the streetcar line was ran there, and they just really never saw a need to bring it further south, uh, coming down Dollison. Uh, but it did go all the way over to uh, Catalpa uh, on uh, Pickwick in the Roundtree neighborhood. Either way, you had to walk about eight blocks to get to the park. Well, Mr. Johnson had an idea. He brought the first uh, buses or jeepneys uh, to uh, Springfield, and uh, he decided that he was going to use these more for a marketing uh, tool than anything. You can meet him up on the square, and uh, they would pick you up, drive you to the park on the weekends, and you'd come to uh, WW's house on Phelps Grove, and they had a big map of the park, and they would take you out and show you some property, and then you could spend some time there, and then they'd take you back. Today, we kind of think of this as more like a timeshare type deal. Um, I don't know if he really had much luck with this, as really the only houses that ever sold uh, on the park uh, prior to World War II were on clay, or what back then called West Drive, and that would be in between Catalpa and uh, Bennett. So how in the world does an airplane figure in the Phelps Grove Park? Well, uh, Lieutenant Ralph Snavely, uh, after World War I, he had went down to Texas and bought a, a spare Jenny and brought it up here. 
and started the Snavely Aero Company. And then they would uh, fly people uh, from Phelps Grove Park for the costly sum of $10, which was quite a bit of money in the 20s. Uh, the University Heights area and parts of Fast Night uh, Park, which had not been developed yet, were great spots. Uh, they were nice, flat, level areas with no trees where he could take off or land. He did keep his plane on an occasion over at MSU near their football field because that was also a great place to take off from. Uh, this was something that he learned to do during the war. Then we have the Napsinger uh, Buttercream Bread Company that was located downtown. And then they would uh, sponsor him. Uh, sometimes you could bring a wrapper or do different things and you could get a reduced price or he'd pick somebody to take up. He'd do some stunt flying over the park and then he'd land and take somebody up if they wanted to pay. So it was quite an interesting thing. So it's hard to imagine that University Heights or parts of Fast Night used to be airstrips, but they were. So, one thing that I talk a lot about is the zoo. Uh, the first city zoo was in Phelps Grove Park by 1917. It was located on the west side of the park near Clay, just south of where the tennis courts are that are in the park. Not the ones that are next to National, but the ones that are actually in the park. Uh, they had a myriad of all sorts of different animals, a lot of Midwest featured animals, uh, certain birds and stuff. On an occasion, somebody would visit uh, down around uh, Florida or Alabama or, and, and bring back an alligator, and, and they'd had several alligators that they would end up in, in, uh, keeping. But they had geese and swans, uh, all sorts of waterfowl. Uh, they had a few buffalo, some bears, um, alligators. Um, you would think with it being the first part that we would have tons and tons of photographs of this thing and what i'm showing you is pretty much all that we have don't know why or there are a lot of family photo albums but we just don't seem to have copies of them well that was a kind of a detriment to trying to sell real estate around the park because most women especially in the days pre-air conditioning uh, they didn't want to hear animals and the smells of animals um, in the evenings when they would have their windows open trying to go to sleep. So uh, they decided that it was time to move all the animals up to now Dickerson Park Zoo. Back then it was just called the Zoo Park. And then uh, the cages and that were removed. If you go over to the zoo today, you can still see the uh, basically concrete lines around the park there in the ground. That's where the cage is set. Well, another great feature over there, we never had a swimming pool outside of the lake, so in 1934 they decided they would build a wading pool. Now, it wasn't the prettiest wading pool, and the barbed wire around it really didn't add a lot of love, but people absolutely adored taking their kids there and swimming. And uh, by 1989, it was in bad shape. Uh, thankfully, we were able, through some donations and parents and the Parks Board, work together. They tore it down and then rebuilt the pool. We now know it today as the McGee-McGregor Wading Pool. And it's uh, just uh, right across from my church at Trinity uh, Lutheran Church. WPA would play a big role in helping to uh, further improve the Phelps Grove Park. The WPA and the Colonial Hotel. Now, I know you're asking, now, how in the world does the Colonial Hotel have anything to do with Phelps Grove? Well, stay tuned and you'll find out. In 1936, WPA started working on the park. Uh, they started lining Fast Night Creek. Uh, they uh, basically have these little stamps that you see on the side there. If you walk over there, it says WPA, and then April 25th, 1936. And that's when they started working and lining all that. Because before, it was just... Uh, just dirt and it could get washed away and it wasn't very pretty and it gets kind of weedy so this was a great way of, of cleaning that up. They then started working on the old lake and ended up uh, building the open-air theater that we know today that's just uh, west of the art museum. 
you can see in this aerial view where they started working on it. You also see this clover leaf. This clover leaf there in the middle, that would be a fountain that was there. And uh, then they'd have some uh, concrete walkways that went up to the open air theater. Now, the walkways are there, the theater is there. The fountain is under the parking lot right now, the art museum. Uh, for whatever reason, it seemed to uh, leak, not ever hold much water. And a lot of kids that grew up in the area told me that was kind of their place to go roller skating. So long before the uh, longboards started hitting the concrete jungles of today, the kids would roller skate in the middle of Phelps Grove Park. Here is a photo of the uh, open air stage after it was completed in July of 1936. And it is still there today. Well, how does the Colonial Hotel tie into all this? Well, when they decided to widen the street, these columns were too close to the street, so they were taken down and put in storage. Mr. Nichols, who was actually uh, uh, tied to uh, Doug Landers and Mary Landers, um, he ended up uh, having these in his possession, so he donated them in 1933. The columns ended up uh, being utilize uh, for a little bit as the entrance into the park and then they were moved over here by the open-air amphitheater and they've been there ever since. Another thing to look for uh, if you're driving really slow and you look down in the canal you will actually see the words Phelps Grove Park spelled out. Now, originally, those held flowers, and in springtime, they would bloom beautiful colors. Of course, that meant somebody had to take care of them, and uh, that takes time and money, and the Parks Board did not have that, so later on, they just decided to fill that in with concrete. So, the building boom after World War II. Well, what happened? Uh, you have to remember the subdivision had been laid out in 1912, actively marketed since 1914, and they only sold a handful of lots basically between Catalpa and Bennett. So, after the war, uh, the land was acquired by uh, Mr. Batchelder. Mr. Batchelder had built some wonderful English homes here. Uh, in University Heights and uh, uh, over by Wickman Gardens on Limwood, and uh, also had a subdivision that was uh, down uh, near Messiah Lutheran Church, and uh, he was able to acquire uh, all this land that had not sold, and then he re-subdivided it and called it Phelps Park Terrace. So sometime between 46, 47, they start putting these things up for sale. And this was a great idea because there wasn't a lot of lots really close to downtown. And uh, these lots were going to be smaller than the original, but still a good size. And by then the park was well established. So needless to say, they sold very, very well. Uh, beautiful ranch homes were what were put in. Uh, after the war, a lot of people that were older and we didn't have the uh, orthopedic surgeons and rehab that we have today uh, found themselves with these big, beautiful two- and three-story homes that were on St. Louis Street and Walnut Street and over in Roundtree. So they would come over here and build these beautiful ranch one-level homes. Uh, some were even only two bedrooms because they tend to entertain and wanted more entertainment space. And that was the case of this uh, beautiful house here. It's a big, sprawling ranch. Um, and uh, this was owned by the Lipscomb family. And uh, it was it's just recently... Uh, sold again, but it's a beautiful, beautiful home. At the end of the street here of Brookside and uh, Clay, we have the Van Hook home, and it's been wonderfully restored as well. These, these homes are highly, highly sought after around the park. They are quite expensive, though. The ball field was built in 1950, and that would be near Glenstone. Uh, the uh, boys of Jarrett Junior High came over to lend their hand, and they basically had to go through all there and dig out all the rocks they could. The outline for that field's over there, although I don't see ball played there much anymore. Trinity Lutheran Church, this is my church, um, they ended up moving over there as well. And they hired famed architect 
Richard uh, Dick Stahl. Now, uh, Dick had worked with Carl Bisman since the, the mid-30s, and uh, he was really our first modern, uh, well, what we would call modern then. Uh, now we call it mid-century, but uh, he was our first modern architect. He had designed a church uh, for another congregation in town. Uh, the congregation hated it so much that half of them left. So uh, his uh, stipulation when he designed Trinity Lutheran Church in Phelps Grove that he had to have 100% buy-in from the entire congregation or he wasn't going to do it. And he was lucky. Everybody loved his idea, and they built it. This was uh, the about uh, a week or two before it officially opened. They hadn't poured the drive yet, but you can kind of get an idea of the mid-century look. Well, Phelps Grove Park... Uh, not, didn't always have a garden. And in fact, uh, it was the ladies who moved in and some of the guys who moved into Phelps Park Terrace after the war who went to the parks board and asked them if they could set up a garden there in the park. Uh, recently, it's been completely reworked and redone. They took out a lot of the uh, brickwork and lights and stuff that they had. Uh, some of the flowers had become diseased. Uh, but it was a spot that was actually maintained by the citizens. We also ended up having a memorial garden. Now, originally, this was a, a fountain that was dedicated to the orphans that Mary Phelps had uh, taken care of uh, during the Civil War and afterwards. And unfortunately, some uh, neighborhood boys uh, had the nasty habit of whopping off its head, and they would find the head laying around uh, the neighborhood. And finally, after a couple of times, they ended up removing the uh, statue from the fountains and eventually they just filled it all in. Today it is now the Memorial Garden. They decided next thing that needed to go into the park would be the art museum. Well it's interesting because that wasn't the first spot they picked. They were actually going to use the Woodruff Martin house which had recently um, been owned by uh, Charles Martin and their family wanted to sell it. Um, they found, though, that it was kind of landlocked. It was far away from things like the park in downtown, and so they opted to uh, not go with that, which was a good thing because uh, that is where KWTO Studios would eventually go. The construction of the uh, new art museum uh, took place in 1958. Um, they uh, raised the funds to do this. It's the small section with the butterfly wing roof that you kind of see when you drive by there today. It's kind of in the middle. But again, it too was very uh, modern looking. It opened on October the 5th, 1958. Weldon King, who uh, lived over in the Roundtree area, when was also a life photographer, he was the first exhibit that was put in there. Uh, to be a rotating exhibit. And of course, the Art mu Museum today is uh, just outstanding. Uh, they have done a phenomenal job expanding, building, improving the programs, and uh, improving its outreach, uh, and is highly sought after as far as places to go in our area. And with that, I thank you for coming and listening to the program. Uh, it's a, always a pleasure to talk about Phelps Grove Park as it is just uh, near and dear to my heart. And if you've not joined, please do. I do have a wonderful history page for Springfield, Missouri, history, landscapes, and photography, and uh, or landmarks, I should say. And it's uh, growing by leaps and bounds. We're pushing somewhere near uh, 18,000 members. Uh, we also have one for Taney County and one for Shannon County. But if you're interested in Springfield's history, please join this wonderful Facebook page if you haven't already. And again, thanks for listening, and I'll talk to you again soon.